Howdy and greetings from the campus of Texas A&M University and College Station. I'm very honored to have you all with us today. I'm Max Angerholzer, proud to be the CEO of the George and Barbara Bush Foundation um, and very excited about the opportunity for us all to have a conversation with Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Um, he's going to share his insights onto everything that's been happening um, in Afghanistan recently and over the last couple of years. This is obviously a very vital and timely conversation. Um, and as evidence of that, this is our largest virtual event that we've ever had at the foundation. So I know thousands of you are watching right now um, and really appreciate you all tuning in for this. Um, I wanted to say thank you real quick to our staff at the George and Barbara Bush Foundation for all of their hard work to make this possible, um, especially Audrey Fidel and the tireless effort she's made. Also wanna thank our friends back in the studios at Texas Ags, they're great partners and proud to work with them. But most importantly, I wanna thank our partners at the Bush Center, um, at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum, and of course, the George Bush School at Texas A&M University. Um, we're honored to work with them every day, and I couldn't have better partners than I have in Warren Finch and Mark Welsh. Also, as a quick plug, I wanna make sure all of you know that the Bush School has now opened a teaching outpost in Washington, D.C., which we're very excited about and General Jay Silveria is running that, and we're really honored to have him on the team now as well. So, um, the hardest part about today's conversation is introducing Ambassador Crocker. Um, he has quite the resume, which you all know. Um, I will just try to give you a few of the highlights. Um, he made it to the top rank of career ambassador at the, in the Foreign Service, um, which not very few many people get to that. He served as ambassador to Lebanon, Syria, Kuwait, Pakistan, Iraq, and Afghanistan. I don't know if I got those in the right order, but I think I got all six of them. Um, he has received <laughs> the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and he's also received the highest civilian honors given by West Point and Annapolis, and he was made an honorary Marine by the Marine Corps. I did not know that anyone could become an honorary Marine, but that seems like a very big deal. So, um, Ambassador Crocker, we're so honored to have you here with us today. Really appreciate your time. Um, and I, I believe you're in Washington State right now, if I'm not mistaken. I am uh, in the great city of Seattle right at the moment. Well, again, thank you for, for your time. And I thought I would just jump right in with a really simple question. Um, so at a 30,000 foot level, um, what do you think the ramifications are for us globally of how we have handled our exit from Afghanistan over the last couple of months. And specifically, how does that impact our relationships with some of our most trusted partners, let's say in NATO? How does this impact um, the example we try to set for fledging democracies around the world? And then how does this impact, say, allies like South Korea and Taiwan that have their own geopolitical issues? Well, again, first, just let me say howdy eggs and uh, howdy aspiring eggs, and I guess I would cover everybody who was on this uh, uh, on this event. Uh, it's uh, it's great to be back, even if virtually. But Max, you have just asked the uh, the ultimate capstone question, uh, and, and I'm I'm afraid that the answer is simple but tough, not good. Uh, and this is just at multiple levels. Uh, we have. Um, uh, in the manner in which we departed, as well as the essence of the departure itself, uh, we've done great damage uh, to our friends and allies inside of Afghanistan, uh, to our own national security interests, uh, and to some of our most, uh, most cherished uh, values as Americans. So let me just give you a couple of headlines here, and uh, we'll go where we want to take it after that. But, um, uh, the narrative is now set for the Taliban, uh, clad only in the armor of the one true faith. Uh, we have vanquished the infidel uh, as we did to the Soviets before them. Now we have done it with the Americans. This is gonna be a huge boost for Islamic militancy around the world. Uh, first address to worry about would be Pakistan itself. I was an ambassador there for three years in the mid 2000s, where they were doing everything possible to maintain a relationship with the Taliban uh, in spite of our 
strong objections uh, because the Taliban was using uh, state havens in Pakistan to attack us in Afghanistan. Their narrative then was, uh, look, we know you. We know you Americans, you come and you go. Uh, you left us in the lurch after the defeat of the Soviets. Um, and we don't know when you're gonna go, but we know you're going because that's what you do. You don't have the staying power. You don't have the patience to see this through. Uh, and that of course is exactly what transpired. We got impatient and we decided we're going home. Doesn't matter what the consequences are. Uh, so they had about 15 minutes of high five and uh, corridors of power in Islamabad and Rawalpindi. Uh, and now they are really worried. Uh, they confront a uh, Islamic militancy problem of their own in Pakistan. That would be the Pakistani Taliban, uh, which aims at regime change, not in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan itself. So uh, they are plenty worried. And we've got to find a way to... Uh, to start dealing effectively with Pakistan again. What is true for Pakistan is broadly true anywhere in the world uh, where there are uh, at least the seeds of Islamic militancy. This is a huge victory uh, for the Taliban and of course for their Al Qaeda partners. Uh, so expect to see again, activity elsewhere. Uh, I worry about the um, Kashmiri militant groups that Pakistan itself uh, formed but has now lost control of. Uh, I think you're gonna hear from groups like uh, Lashkari Taiba that carried out the Mumbai bombings. Uh, so the Indians are deeply worried. The Iranians are deeply worried. They almost went to war with the Taliban government in the late 1990s. Uh, the Chinese should be deeply afraid, uh, having now done everything possible to create a uh, fertile breeding ground uh, for uh, extremism in the west of China by effectively uh, uh, launching a, a, a genocide campaign against their own Muslim population, well, I, that, uh, the Taliban message can be expected to resonate there. So it, it's just bad at almost every level regionally. Now, globally, just as bad. Uh, as you uh, implied in your question, we did not consult with our NATO allies. Uh, inexplicably for the president who said that America is back and we are assuming again our leadership role. Uh, it, it was a stunning unfolding of events. We didn't tell our NATO partners in advance and, and they had to do a hurried evacuation of their own forces. So uh, global leadership, boy, that has taken a big ride. And you might ask, so what? Who, who really cares? Well, uh, the whole world should care. Again, President Biden understands these things. He said at one point before this latest mess, the world won't run by itself. Uh, he was talking about, again, in a partnership with, with trusted allies, that uh, we would regain that leadership role that uh, President Trump really wanted very little to do with. Uh, well, this is a dead wrong way of going about it. So if we don't lead, well, then what? Well, you default to a balance of power system. Uh, what's wrong with the balance of power system? Well, in the last century, it created two world wars. World War I, World War II created the Holocaust, ultimately. And that is still in living memory. So balance of power systems work until they don't, until they become imbalanced. And uh, unless President Biden reverses course globally in fairly short order, we're going to see the emergence of that uh, balance of power world. So again, uh, one small country, uh, a couple of bad months, it, it, may, it may change the course of history. Thank you, Ambassador. And that was a, um, a very great answer and a, and a sweeping and strategic answer to what was a very broad um, and um, unprecise question. I now am thinking what an amazing opportunity your students had when you were dean of the Bush School here to be able to hear from you on a on a daily and weekly basis. So if I could go back and be your student, I would love to do that. So I think one thing kind of dovetailing off some earlier comments you made, I feel like one of the things we've heard from the administration is sort of a trust but verify um, relationship with the Taliban. Um, and that was certainly the case as we were moving toward August 31st. 
And I think we're thankful that even after August 31st, we've been able to get more Americans and some of our Afghan friends out of the country with the help of Qatar, most, most importantly. But what sort of leverage do we still have with the Taliban to get out remaining, remaining Americans and Afghans with the appropriate paperwork and visas? This has obviously been a question that was posed um, to Secretary Blinken yesterday when he was testifying before Chairman Meeks's committee. And I saw some similar questions this morning from Senator Mendez's committee on the Senate side. But what sort of leverage do we even have at this point? The most significant leverage we have is, uh, is money. The Afghan government had uh, almost $10 billion uh, in the U.S. system, in the Federal Reserve system, uh, and those assets have been frozen. Uh, so that uh, theoretically at least provides a fair amount of leverage. The question is going to be how we use it. And here again, I, I see the administration um, compounding the uh, huge problem for us it has already created. Uh, you, you alluded to uh, American citizens uh, or Afghans properly documented uh, with the relevant visas. Well, the uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, special immigrant visa eligible Afghans, uh, well, they, don't, they don't have another nationality. Um, uh, they, uh, they, they don't have uh, visas from or, or for the U.S. It's a 14-point incredibly complex process that takes up to three years from start to finish. Uh, uh, so we're, we're kind of letting the Taliban set the terms here. That, uh, and, and you uh, stated those terms, I think, very clearly. Uh, our citizens or other properly documented Afghans. Well, who decides that? It's going to be the Taliban. Uh, so the horrible irony of those who risk their lives to service uh, in, in our cause are not going to have to clear immigration at Kabul airport with Taliban officials. Uh, and so you're leaving the country. Why, Mr. Mohammed? Ah, because you are an interpreter for the Americans and you are afraid that we will kill you. Let us oblige you here and now. Uh, and I am not hearing anything from the administration that says anything counter to that. We're, uh, you know, we, we, this has already been a horrific blow to us, uh, as I tried to say earlier. Well, well now we're introducing our own values uh, and our commitments, our promises, that we would take care of them, that uh, for Afghan women, uh, we would um, encourage them to step forward, in, to run for parliament, to join the military, to start businesses, and we would have their backs. Well, we don't quite have their backs anymore. Uh, we don't have their backs at all. So I would expect that we had better get ready to see some pretty unpleasant images uh, of what has started happening already with our uh, uh, interpreters who have been hunted down and killed whenever the opportunity presented before our withdrawal. Uh, it is going to go badly for them. It, it's going to go badly for uh, the Afghan females who heeded our, uh, uh, our advice. So the rest of the world is watching. Uh, they are going to see, I'm afraid, more of the same. An America that abandoned those who had helped it at times of crisis, that walked out on a long-term process of bringing women fully into Afghan society. Uh, it, we are presenting ourselves as a country you really don't want to do business with. Um, thank you for, for that, Ambassador. Um, we got countless questions um, and thoughts that came in from our thousands of participants today. And I think one of the questions seems um, appropriate to ask now based on where we are in the conversation. But as we've all seen, um, there have been many reports and stories of former U.S. government officials and veterans of our armed forces who have been helping um, Americans and some of their Afghan friends who are still in the country. Much of this happened before August 31st, and by reports, there's still some of this going on. It's been called a modern underground railroad or a Dunkirk. Do you think that those efforts are 
appropriate and helpful, or do you think that they can be counterproductive because there have been views of both ways on that? So I, I was a small part of, of some of those efforts at the very beginning after the uh, fall of Kabul uh, in mid-August. Uh, I think that was a not just an appropriate reaction, but a, an essential one to just get out any way we could think of uh, those who had helped us since it was pretty clear the government didn't have a plan for it. Uh, I, I'm afraid that window is pretty much closed. I, I think it is definitely closed for evacuations by air. Uh, the, those efforts could only work uh, when um, uh, the Taliban did not control the air force. They now control all of them. Uh, so I, I don't really see much scope for uh, uh, efforts outside government to, to move people to safety. Land crossings, a little bit different. Uh, the Taliban, of course, took control of border land border crossings even before they took Kabul, uh, to ensure for themselves that they knew who was coming in and who was going out. Uh, so it would have to be done in a manner that would evade uh, Taliban scrutiny, uh, and it would be very highly dangerous uh, with the shifting realities in border areas uh, uh, virtually every day. So uh, there are no good options here outside of what the United States government may work out with the Taliban. Uh, and again, just as they effectively conceded uh, to violent Taliban takeover of the country, so too do I worry now with the language they're using of uh, properly documented, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're gonna key on this too, they are, that they already have. Uh, so uh, a lot of vets, um, and I include myself in that number as a civilian who spent a lot of time in combat zones. Um, you know, we're shattered. Uh, it, it becomes deeply personal. I mean, I, I get up every morning and open my electronic mailbox and there are going to be more pleas for help uh, from, from those who are trying to bring at their Afghan interpreters out. And in many cases, because I know a lot of Afghans, uh, from these individuals themselves to say, help me, the Taliban is going to kill me. And I don't have any good answers. None of this does. And the reason I don't have any good answers is because the United States government has not set out uh, clearly defined criteria and delivered a message that says, we're, we're coming to get you out. We're going to find a way, whatever it takes. We're, we're not hearing that. And uh, this is... I, it's, this is this community understands it there at Texas A&M, uh, what this is like for the guys and gals who, who are out there on the front lines who owe their lives, in many cases, to interpreters. Uh, and the word interpreter is chosen carefully. That's what they are, not translators. It's not just about rendering one language into another. It's about all of that uh, uh, perception of society and environment, uh, who's who, that in the irregular war we were engaged in is a matter of life and death. Uh, don't go into this village and here's why. Uh, these folks could interpret that for us. And uh, the pain these vets feel it, by the betrayal of these individuals, they take personally. Uh, they didn't do the betrayal, they hate what's happening, but you just feel powerless to help and I don't have any good advice to give them, frankly. So, you know, as we as we think about those who are still left behind in Afghanistan and wonder what their future looks like, you know, there is some some good news in terms of who has been able to get out and our Afghan friends who are now either in um, allied countries or maybe on military bases here in the United States and trying to, you know, get their paperwork processed in the appropriate way. You know, I saw um, a recent announcement that President Clinton, President George W. Bush, and President Obama are now starting an initiative to, to help um, aid these, these Afghans. Um, there have been some who have called for uh, a czar at the White House who would, who would help with these efforts across the board in terms of getting Afghans out and resettling them. Based upon you know, your experience of working in the region, of, of being a top diplomat, but also having worked really hard on public-private partnerships. 
what can we be doing as a country? What should we be doing to help those that we, that we can? Well, that's another great question. Uh, the presidential initiative, I think, is important, but I would, uh, I would add one more name uh, to those you mentioned. Uh, uh, that would be George H.W. Bush. Uh, uh, his spirit pervades this effort. Uh, this is very, very much in the George H.W. Bush uh, tradition of, of using his influence post-presidency uh, to uh, make things better globally. And he would be all over this. Uh, uh, and it's, it is good to see the former president stepping up. And I am quite confident that uh, in their conversations that uh, that, that fourth presidency is being very positively evoked. Uh, and again, you're right to ask the question, what, what can we do now? Uh, what I uh, have been telling folks is uh, there are thousands of Afghans coming into country, many of them already here, they're going to need support, uh, all kinds of support, financial and uh, 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 social as well. The funding for refugee resettlement is sparse and it doesn't last very long. Uh, so I think everyone, certainly NGOs like uh, No One Left Behind that I have been intimately involved with uh, are uh, doing just that, trying to raise resources, raise money uh, privately uh, to support resettlement efforts for these uh, uh, Afghan heroes. And it's been, it's been gratifying that uh, quite gratifying to me that uh, we found an issue of uh, importance and that is uh, in fact uh, uh, a matter of bipartisan agreement. Yeah, uh, Republican voices have been raised as well as Democratic saying we've got to help these people. They, they put their lives on the line for us. We've got to help them. Uh, here in Spokane, Washington, Spokane County, reliably red county, uh, uh, we're getting set to uh, to welcome hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, Afghans into our communities. We have always been uh, uh, in the forefront of refugee resettlement. We we know how much refugees contribute uh, to to America, not just financially. And uh, the statistics show that they will they will give back far more than they take uh, as they get their feet on the ground. Uh, but also in terms of our core values uh, and that at least is good news, but it is going to require a lot of money that hasn't hit the table yet. And given the realities, a, a lot of that money is going to have to be raised privately. So uh, anyone with a little spare change uh, left after contributing handsomely uh, to the Bush School and the Bush Foundation, uh, uh, it would be really great to, uh, to write in Afghan refugee resettlement. Well, um, thank you, sir. And um, as the former dean of, of the Bush School, I see you haven't lost your, your strength at fundraising. So thank you for that stewardship pitch. Also, thank you for evoking President George H.W. Bush. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think that these three former presidents are, are channeling his spirit right now. Um, and my hope is that the spirit of President George H.W. Bush can get us all to a better place and can push us in the direction we need to go as a country, whether that is supporting our Afghan friends or the myriad of other challenges that we face. Um, another question that we got from, from one of our STEAM participants is with regards to the new Taliban government. You know, I know that um, there was some talk in, the, in recent weeks and months that the Taliban had changed and that they had learned how they erred in their ways back in the 1990s and that we were gonna see a more moderate kinder, gentler Taliban. Obviously, we have not seen that through some of the gruesome videos that, that you referenced earlier in some of these awful reports about how, you know, especially women and girls are already suffering in very tragic ways. Um, I think two of the members of the Taliban cabinet um, are on the FBI's most wanted list. So how do we as a country um, and working with some of our Western alliance powers how do we engage a government that is already proving um, to do some of the most dastardly things and is already pulling back the curtain in very concerning ways? How do we engage them without giving them 
too much credit without giving them too much cover for their human rights violations, but at the same time trying to protect our interests. And that is the precisely the kind of uh, very complex, multifaceted, extremely difficult decisions uh, that uh, are at the base, really, of, of what uh, our students deal with at the Bush School. Uh, you know, we, we don't have a lot of room for idealism. Uh, show me how stuff works on the ground under nearly impossible circumstances. So I am sure that uh, any number of capstone projects are already in the, uh, uh, the grist mill on, on issues just such as this, because there are no uh, good answers or easy solutions. In the case of the first uh, Taliban government that we've seen, uh, I think it is correct. This is a different Taliban than the Taliban that ruled in the 1990s. The problem is it's much worse. Uh, you look, for example, at uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani, uh, now the Minister of, the Minister of Interior for this uh, transitional government, uh, and who bedeviled us uh, for, for years from his uh, outpost in the Pakistani tribal areas in, in uh, North Waziristan. Uh, he, he is not kinder and gentler, let me tell you, uh, uh, a very effective killer. And uh, just to point out what I hope is obvious, the uh, Ministry of Interior in Afghanistan is uh, not uh, uh, consumed with saving national forests uh, and national parks. Uh, they're about killing people. And uh, the fact that the most efficient killer I know of uh, Siraj Dean of Haqqani has been brought into that position and tells you all you need to know about the nature and the agenda of this new government. Uh, uh, never underestimate your enemy as the, uh, the, the saying goes. Well, these guys um, are uh, tougher, harder, meaner, more effective, uh, if, if they are anything, than was the Taliban government of the 90s. Look, we have, we have killed the slow and stupid ones. Uh, the ones that are out there now, that are now taking these positions of leadership are in essence, the worst of the worst. Uh, so in terms of dealing with this government, obviously we share the humanitarian concerns of many. Uh, it is, and it is the kind of thing where I think we will wanna get behind, not launch our own efforts, but get behind international efforts. Uh, the more we can do now to show international solidarity and to forge international solidarity, uh, the, the more likely it is uh, that we can blunt some of the uh, worst of the behavior that the Taliban is probably uh, contemplating even now. Um, thank you for that assessment. I wish it was more encouraging, but we appreciate your honesty. You know, I think one of the reports that, that we've heard in the last 24 hours is apparently the, the DIA and the CIA have said that Al Qaeda is already reconstituting itself in Afghanistan and that they think within two years they may have the strength and the capability to, to strike the American homeland, um, which should all make us very nervous and, and anguished. You mentioned Pakistan earlier, and of course you served as ambassador there, and so there, there are very few people who understand the Afghanistan-Pakistan relationship as well as you do, being on both sides of the border. Is there an opportunity here for us? You know, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship has been complicated at best, um, and you referenced that earlier. Is there an opportunity here for us to re-engage Pakistan in a more constructive way now that they see the challenges they've got across the border? and dealing with their own um, radicals in country? Uh, uh, Max, I think absolutely there is an opportunity now. The strategic calculus that drove Pakistani policy uh, uh, over the last two decades, and indeed before, going back to the mid-90s, when uh, uh, the Taliban, supported by Pakistan, took control of most of Afghanistan. Uh, so yes, there is an opportunity. Uh, uh, as I said, they are plenty worried about their own stability, and uh, we should be plenty worried about their stability as well. Just, you know, look at the numbers. Uh, the sixth most populous country in the world, 220 million. Um, the seventh largest standing army, 
and the eighth nuclear weapons power. Uh, so if Pakistan shakes itself apart here, uh, the, the consequences are gonna be huge. So we gotta find ways to talk to them. And I understand there are channels now that we're pursuing. Uh, it's gonna be a different conversation than the one we've had, the ones I've had uh, for three long, hard years hearing the same thing. Uh, the world has shifted and not in a good way. Uh, lots of recriminations to uh, uh, apply to everyone out there, but we have got to get into a strategic dialogue with the Pakistanis and indeed with the Indians. Uh, uh, preferably before the next Mumbai attack happens. So, uh, yeah, we, we should uh, be doing everything we can with Pakistanis to say it is a new world, not in a good way. Let's leave behind our, our baggage of the past and let's figure out how we can uh, prevent it from getting a whole lot worse in the future. Um, thank you. In, in the vein of trying to influence Afghanistan through partners, and, you know, Qatar was mentioned earlier, um, you obviously served in the Gulf earlier in your career. What are the opportunities here for us to lean on um, some of our allies in the Gulf more? You know, I think, of, I think of UAE, I think of the Kingdom. Obviously, Qatar is already important because of their channels to the Taliban. Um, what, what can we count on them to help us with? How, how can we better engage that part of the Gulf in supporting this? Well, again, it's a great question. And uh, we start by doing just that, engaging. Uh, again, to give a little credit here, uh, I think the administration in the last couple of weeks has been doing that. Uh, uh, Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, and Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, uh, made a lengthy tour of the Gulf region, uh, for example, uh, visiting Qatar, but also visiting the other Gulf states. Uh, what they have that uh, the problem needs is, of course, uh, access to money uh, and need them to spend it in uh, in have the right sorts of ways. They've spent a lot of it uh, in not such uh, productive ways over the years to support for the Madras system, for example, in Pakistan. Uh, but again, it's a new era now. And I hope the administration is making that clear in our conversations. Uh, they do seem to be interested in rejuvenating our traditional uh, alliances, which have been in, in the Gulf area, have been in pretty bad repair for a pretty long time. Uh, just to drive home the point that this is not a defeat only for the US, this is not a threat uh, only to Afghanistan's neighbors, uh, it is a threat to all of us. Uh, they have the means and we need to be talking to them about how they can best deploy these means uh, for a, the construction of a better place than the one we're in now. So we all just um, remembered um, the 20th anniversary of that, of that terrible day on September 11th, 2001. Um, and I think, you know, in the aftermath of that, I think one of the things that was very heartening to me and to, I know, all Americans was how our friends stepped up and specifically how the transatlantic relationship played such an important part um, and how we responded to that. Um, and our allies at NATO invoking the Article 5 for the first time um, in support of the United States, which was an extraordinary moment. I know you've already had six ambassadorial posts, and I know that we already have um, a, a NATO ambassador, I believe at least nominated, if, if not confirmed, for the Biden administration. But if you were serving as NATO ambassador right now, how would you be interacting with your counterparts? What, what could you be doing here to, to reassure them that in spite of what's happened in recent weeks and in spite of some of the reports about us not coordinating with them as well as we may have um, preferred to or we should have, what do we need to be doing right now to, to try to move forward and make sure they know we're still in lockstep with them and we're looking at the other challenges that we all face together? Uh, well, there again, Max, it's, uh, it's engagement. Uh, uh, not to talk about it, just to do it, to do what we didn't do uh, when we announced the full withdrawal of our forces. Uh, uh, I think that NATO um, can be brought around to a better place than it is now vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Uh, it'll take a sustained effort. We did real damage uh, to our credibility and our uh, reputation as a reliable partner uh, uh, inside NATO. And, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff is very painful. For, for years, of course, we have beat 
the NATO allies about the head and shoulders over the need to do more in their defense spending. Uh, well, you know, that isn't going to resonate so well right now. Uh, you know, we should spend more money on better equipment so we can hand it over to the uh, next adversary that takes up control of the country because we didn't have the sticking power. Uh, it, this is going to be an uphill drive, but we got to make it. And again, uh, it, it, it's not all black, black, black. Uh, if you look at the uh, Trump administration, for example, uh, Kay Bailey Hutchison, Texas's own, was our ambassador to NATO, and uh, she did a terrific job, uh, particularly under the circumstances of regularly sending a message that how important NATO is. Uh, uh, folks like uh, Admiral Braithwaite, uh, Ambassador Braithwaite, who was our ambassador to uh, to Norway, same thing. Uh, he, uh, you may recall, came back uh, as Secretary of the Navy after some pretty bad scandals there. He, he set that all to right. So uh, we, we did have prominent figures, even in the Trump administration, that spent uh, time and effort with NATO. Uh, and uh, I'm sure they will be a, a source of reference as we move ahead. Thank you. Um, as you know, um, the George and Barbara Bush Foundation is, we have a multifaceted mission. Um, you know, part of what we try to do and very important of what we do is protecting and amplifying the legacies of George and Barbara Bush, trying to share their ideals and values with um, more stakeholders here and abroad and introduce them to a new generation of Americans who maybe weren't adults or maybe weren't even born um, when they were still in the White House. We also look at those lessons of history and our work with the library and the museum is so important there. And then particularly how we try to support and partner with the Bush School. Um, and I think that our relationship with the Bush School makes our foundation very unique and I think it is sort of our, our intellectual outreach and our ability to um, inspire and try to engage the future generation of leaders to try to you know, help them understand these lessons that we're facing now and hopefully learn from them. As you know, Mark Twain apparently said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it can rhyme. And we've had some amazing deans um, at the Bush School. Mark Welsh is extraordinary. I'm very biased towards Andy Card for a variety of reasons. Um, and you had a great two tenures there as dean. But if you were brought back to teach a course, maybe next spring, on the lessons from Afghanistan, whether that's over 20 years or whether that's over the last six months, and I was a master's student in your class, what are some of those lessons that, that we should be taking from this? I, I know some of this is fresh, and three months from now, six months from now, the insights may be different. Um, but if you were in the classroom again right now and you were trying to share those, those lessons with future public servants, where would you start? Well, you could start almost anywhere in the atmosphere of the Bush School and uh, uh, put together a very good course offering, I think. Uh, again, the students we have, uh, the fact that we don't have a PhD program, we don't have undergrads except in a three plus two context, uh, uh, mean that we're, we're all about walking the walk. We're not uh, in the business of developing the next generation of, uh, of academics. So that is important, clearly. Uh, uh, we're in the business, or I was in the business, of uh, developing the next generation of George H.W. Bush, uh, strategic thinkers uh, who know how to make a difference, how to, how to apply theory on the ground and make facts out of it. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, I think the lessons uh, are, are kind of clear. Uh, one thing that helped me was to get a theoretical sense uh, of the region of the Middle East uh, and how the U.S. played into it, often historically, just to have that kind of compass in front of me to, uh, and a context to evaluate uh, the uh, calamitous events of the day, whatever they might be. I mean, if it's the Middle East, it will uh, be another calamitous day. It's just the way things go. Uh, but to understand that uh, as uh, awful as the current moment may be for whatever reasons, it's probably not without precedent. Look at those precedents. Uh, now, in the immediate case, uh, a couple of my mantras would be on the table. Uh, uh, one of them is be careful what you get into uh, if it involves kinetic force. Uh, that by invading someone else's country and overthrowing its leadership, you're setting in motion 
uh, forces that will deliver not just third and fourth order consequences, but 30th and 40th order uh, that you cannot possibly plan for or even foresee. So be sure before you cross the line of departure that uh, the evil you seek to eradicate or the, uh, the benefits you seek to accrue are worth not just the downsides, but worth the huge weight of the unknown that you are landing on your shoulders. Uh, because again, it's not just that we don't plan, it's that in many respects we can't because our imagination will not carry us far enough to identify something that may happen three years from now. This is true in Iraq and Afghanistan as it ever could be. So careful getting in. And I actually, I did not learn that first in Iraq or Afghanistan. I learned it in Lebanon. Uh, I was there in the early 80s when the Israelis thought it was a fine idea to eliminate the PLO military presence in the country with justification. Uh, they had inflicted uh, a lot of harm and a lot of grief uh, in cross-border raids, and it killed a lot of Israelis. Uh, what they did not foresee and what we did not foresee, that in getting rid of the Taliban, we were doing serious work for them uh, and opening the door for Hezbollah. We kind of forgot, and they kind of forgot, that just next door in Iran, there was now an Islamic Republic uh, that would follow the, uh, the Iranian monarchy in uh, ex expanding its power beyond its borders. Shah did it con with conventional forces. The Iranians, with Syrian support, did it unconventionally, Hezbollah. So effectively, the, uh, is Israel, with our full support, traded the PLO for Hezbollah. Uh, and there ensued an 18 year Israeli occupation of the South uh, that when it ended in 2000, the Israelis had lost more than um, 1,100 troopers over the years. And that is a huge number for a country of that size. And they gained absolutely nothing uh, except an ongoing Hezbollah problem. So be careful what you get into. But the flip side is also true. Be careful what you get out of and how you get out of it. That is crystal clear right now in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, we went in for the right reasons. I, I was part of that initial effort. I opened the embassy. Uh, we knew why we were there to make sure another 9-11 could not be imagined uh, and prepared and ultimately executed from Af Afghan soil. Uh, so that becomes pretty important. And then when you look at now what we've just done, we, we actually put the band back together again, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. I think the intelligence assessments you mentioned are dead right. Uh, Al-Qaeda will come back. They are already back in some cases. Uh, bin Laden's chief of security did a little press stand up when he got into Namgahar province again. Uh, so we, uh, we've seen the movie and it is not a romance, it's a documentary. Uh, the, steps that we have now created uh, have heightened the threat to the homeland uh, very extensively. So be at least as careful getting out as you were going in. Now in Iraq, we blew it on both counts. Um, although we're fighting our way back to what may be some modicum of uh, stability in that country, but far longer than it should have taken. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, Sadly, we've written the next chapter, and it is a pretty ugly one, and it will be followed by other chapters uh, that I can't quite imagine just yet. Trust me, they're out there. So careful in, careful out, and when you are in, if you have gone in, remember what we started this conversation with, strategic patience. Uh, our adversaries have come to count on our impatience, uh, uh, and our allies have come to fear it. So uh, what we have to do is find a way to communicate a different narrative that can only uh, have resonance if we walk the walk on it. You know, the, the Taliban, I think it was apocryphal, but it's, it's still a great line, uh, was uh, quoted as having said uh, in the early going in, in Afghanistan after 9-11, you Americans have the watches, we, the Taliban, have the time. So careful in, careful out, that is subsumed under the need for, again, 
strategic patience, the ability to commit for the long term, to have thought through what our interests are that we are seeking to advance, what threats we seek to avert, and stay the course. Uh, this requires the use of the bully pulpit in the White House. Our previous few presidents have not seen fit to do this. Uh, President Trump does indeed bear a huge responsibility for what's happened. Uh, because he was the one who initiated those talks with the Taliban that excluded the Afghan government and therefore delegitimized de it. Uh, and I just wanted to get that in there. This is not all on Biden. Uh, President Trump dealt him a very bad hand. Unfortunately, President Biden, as the sitting president of the United States, uh, then played it even worse than it was dealt. Ambassador, thank you for this extraordinary 45 minutes, this, this master class on Afghanistan and the, and the larger region and world. Um, we're so thankful um, for our relationship with you and, and so proud that you used to walk the halls here at the Bush Center. Um, thank you for your service. Thank you for all you've done for our country and for our allies around the world. And thank you for what you're still doing. I know that even if you're not currently an ambassador, um, you're still operating um, day in and day out and you're very active. And so thank you for your continued public service. Um, we are honored to, to call you a friend um, and really appreciate um, all that you stand for and all that you do. Well, and thank you, Max. And I, I would just add one more uh, imperative to current students out there, gig them. It's the perfect way to end it, sir. Thank you so much. Um, take care, and we'll welcome you back at an Aggie football game anytime. I look forward to it, Max. Thanks for having me. Thank you.